until until the end of the mic. Make sure that I can, people can hear me online. And um, good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be able to present to you a part of my current PhD project, uh, looking at the trials, tribulations, and results of my attempts to find email contrib contributors in use herbarium of human leading plants. Specifically, I am looking at the earliest uh, publication on North American flora. In 1840, uh, the first director of Kew Gardens, William Jackson Hooker, published an unprecedentedly robust flora on the botany of British North America titled Flora Aurea, Aurea Americana, or the flora of the British possession of North America, published between 1829 and 1840. The project brought together botanicals collected from Arctic expeditions, traveling British naturalists, and local herbarians such as that of Carlinaeus, Joseph Banks, and Iron Roper along them. In the 500 page work of approximately 5,000 plants and more than 120 contacts, three women, Harriet Shepherd, Anne Mary Percival, and Lady Dalhousie, were responsible for over 80% of the Quebec plants in her first herbarium, which today would have been made up the basis of Hughes herbarium as we. See it today. Um, and of all these contacts I should mention, um, we'll inject in the very number one slide. Though once a complete collection at Kew, today the specimens from Hooker's herbarium um, for this project have been found in museums and archives as close as friends in Edinburgh and as far as the field as found in North America, in New York, and Montreal. This has led to an incomplete and inaccurate narrative of the flora that glazes over its female contributors. So I asked how did these women go unnoticed for two centuries? Despite their extensive contributions, how do we find these female contributors in the herbarium and in archives? Focusing primarily on the gardens, I argue that interdependent continental and inter archive communication is necessary to address the histories of objects and names that have been dislocated, displaced, and disregarded over time. So this presentation will further demonstrate how to follow the movements of female botanists using unusual archives related to natural history collections. And in doing so, we can better demystify how plants, people, and ideas travel to herbariums across continents, such as um, sorry, across continents, such as Pew, and give voice to post-colonial stories of underrepresented female contributors in natural history collections. But first, I want to address um, that while the botanical specimens of Hooker's project were collected, preserved, sent, stored, and cataloged in the first half of the 19th century within a framework formed and heavily reliant on the colonial enterprise, there are also objects of science in Hughes' present day herbarium. What then do we mean when we talk about a post colonial herbarium? Considering the definition of post-colonialism and that of an herbaria, I contextualize my research findings within the larger institutional and discursive project to reclaim and reconsider the history and agency of the time of specimens and contributors that were historically subordinate under various forms of materials. These relics of 19th century science double both as active botanical agents and instances of archivalization, which considered archives as memory because they are evidence. According to scholar Eric Tello, Quote, they are not only evidence of a transaction, but evidence of some historic fact that is either part of the transaction itself or that may be traced via the transaction or that which is otherwise embodied in the record or in the context of the operating process. So the search and reclamation of female botanists responds, in my view, to one of the basic questions many post-colonial historians, theorists, and other writers have asked. How does the non-European world write its own history? And how is feminist and post-colonial botanical history then extracted from joining or rejoining the herbarium with the archive and the library? With many questions, I'm going to focus uh, on two, which highlight the intersectional biases that make finding the Canadian women in the botanical archive difficult. First, how can we find women in the botanical library, archive, and herbarium, respectively, and consolidate the information gathered to get a more holistic picture? Secondly, how can we identify Canadian contributors of, to the post-colonial herbarium? With regards to Hooker's Flora Boreal Americana specifically, how do we consider Canadian contributions in a time that predates the Canadian Confederation of 1870? For the sake of my research, I consider my case study Harriet Shepherd to be a Canadian contributor to the herbarium, as she was born in Nova Scotia, raised in Quebec City, and involved in social and intellectual support of Quebec's elite political society. Consequently, her work can be considered one of the earliest contributions of Canadian body to use collection, with some of her earliest letters and specimens dated to the 1820s. 
there are three places in mechanical institutions where, in my opinion, you need to look for Canadian women. In most instances, I argue you need to look at all three to get a complete idea. The first place is to look in the library if you want and quantify your findings as much as possible. For Hooker's Flora Boreal Americana, it's set in two large volumes, um, which I use as the basis of my research. Through a lengthy transcription process, I am identifying and quantifying the number of contributors and isolating case studies, um, such as that of Harriet Shepard, Lady Dalhousie, and Anne Mary Percival, who, as I stated, were responsible for 80% of the specimens from Quebec and Lower Canada in the work. This is despite all acknowledged female contributors making up only 6% of contributions. These types of statistics I'm able to get by doing this transcription process from a library catalog source. Second, I look for letters and miscellaneous of them read in the archives. Letters in the archives provide information on when, where, and how pen collectors or blood sent specimens to William Jackson Hook, both while he was at Glasgow as the Regent Professor of Botany, and later when he brought the urban and moved to Kew. I primarily use the Director's Correspondence Project, in which over 20 letters refer to the Bora Bora American Project. Though I also make use of correspondence between John Tory and Hooker, letters from she the Shepherds and Dalhouses at McGill University, and miscellaneous ephemera health at the Bibliothèque Archive Nationale de Quebec. Thirdly, I look at herbarium specimens as I look at herbarium specimens as they can provide visual material information as to how Hooker outsourced his material to establish information on distribution graphs of new and rare species in British North America. These pages, complemented by the correspondence and habitat descriptions in the published flora, build a picture of scientific investigation based on a comparative literature and inviting ongoing debates. With these resources in mind, I'll walk you through my four part methodology that I'm using to find women in Kew who contributed to this project. It starts with first finding the specimens, reconstructing uh, how they were collected, acknowledging the contributions, and then how to share the story with these marginalized contributors and all based on the first, again, transcription process I'm doing with the, with the publication. These steps enabled me to extrapolate from what was termed the Hookerian herbarium, a network of female botanists outline their involvement, analyze their contributions as they currently exist in the institution, and ask further pertinent questions that shed light on why, with their specimens dislocated, their contributions have consequently gone overlooked. Step one entails finding the specimens mentioned in Hooker's publication. By breaking down the entries, I was able to identify how Hooker recorded the taxonomy, taxonomy of the specimens, references, and wrote his habitat descriptions. The most important part for me in Hooker's project was um, his need to specify which contributor submitted the specimen from which location in his goal to establish the breadth of habitat distribution of that species. We see in this, for example, uh, in this example of the Gugier specimens, where dried specimens were received from Canada by the Hirsch and Dr. Todd, as well as Mrs. Shepard and Mrs. Percival, while a different specimen was submitted by Ms. Brenton from Newfoundland, indicating um, the, con the contributors, it, their names are in italics, while the uh, locations are in plain text. And just to show, I won't focus on it, but um, the references he would make to um, previously published material would be just following the name. So, for example, then the Collectanium Botanica would be in reference to this image, um, and the Neotia Pubescens will would be in reference to a woven publication who had already identified it. Themselves. With Hooker's um, Gratiola neglecta, another example image here, we see a clear example of the different names associated with different locations, including one which is actually missing from the sheet. It is my lifelong goal. I can die happy if I actually find where this missing piece kind of is. <laughs> um, but um, we here get a glimpse into Hooker's process where he amassed and then compared specimens to confirm whether they were in fact one of the same or of a different genus or species entirely. And you can see here we have Canada related to Mrs. Percival, which is the central image um, just over there. And then to the right, we have Douglas, um, who is associated with the Northwest Coast. Lake Winnipeg is designated there to Drummond, who traveled with Richardson, which is why their names sometimes are interchangeable. Um, and lastly, just a note that says um, one of the uh, potential names at the bottom, right? As uh, sometimes the specimens that were sent and given names by their contributors. Um, was one that Hooker did not agree with and would choose to designate his own when writing up his descriptions. 
Going back to the first example of blue chair pubescence, which appear now follows as blue chair reference in a, in a moment, um, Mrs. Shepherd had actually sent a video of pubescence with her um, in 1829. Um, I narrowed my search in looking for the letters that mentioned um, the species by Shepherd um, in the Director's Correspondence Project. This letter, dated from the 25th of October 1829, is when she mentions a family trip near her garden state considered to affect the top of Justin, where she found, among other plants, the Fugir of Cubescence. It's um, in this portion of the text, which I've um, written out and put in red and underlined when she mentions it, which she appears to have identified correctly as um, her agreement and published it as such. Further evidence can be found in the physical specimen uh, sheets when consulted. So as you can see here, the GRQ Bessons is titled with Book of Pastid, the location um, right under the name, and July of 1829, where it has the letter describes you when she traveled to that location to source it. And we have here the lovely HS, um, which is her uh, initial signature. Um, it is highly likely that this would, would have potentially been in her own hands. Um, as oftentimes a note would be sent with the specimens in a parcel. Um, and when I look at hookers um, in other in other instances, hooker tends to have a contributor noted as Mr. or Mrs. So and so, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, but there are collections just have the HS. Um, further evidence can be found, uh, no, just, though you may notice another another label. Uh, taped in and printed in French that was donated by Sir William Hooker in 1845. That's because the specimen, while at some point was at Kew, was actually donated and can now be found at the Museum National d'Histoire in Paris, France. Um, after some research, I found out that it was in that year that Hooker's son, Joseph Dalton Hooker, who you might have heard more about than Kew, traveled to Paris and likely brought with the best trade or gift from his father with that um, museum. It is also here now written as Fujiya Reppens, which is the present day accepted taxonomic name. So, following to step two, once I've identified it, and I want to emphasize this is one example from many that I didn't follow up on, um, is to reconstruct the journey of the specimen from the hands of the Canadian botanist in North America to Hooker, and then even later to where it is now today. This timeline shows the reconstruction that I've just described with Fujiya Reppens from both of its taxon in Quebec to Hooker and then to Paris, where it now remains. I find this extremely important since Q's herbarium does not currently have any means to highlight the catalog entries which were once present but are now displaced, besides looking at the in out um, non digitized books from these early days. It is here where many contributors remain unnoticed and run the risk of being lost to us if we don't pursue our research further. Um, so I go deeper and again reconstructed how and where Harriet specimen traveled, remembering all the while that even though her specimen was away, the publication bearing uh, her name as a contributor, as well as her letters, which show and explain how that specimen got to you, um, remains there. Um, I'm going to uh, pass. I'm going to go past these few slides, but if you would like more information on the history and biography of Harriet Shepherd and the other ladies, please do comment after so you can find from the table. This is an example of um, an excerpt from the spreadsheet that I'm working with, which will enable a uh, one time document. Um, I've looked mostly for women, but there's the potential to look at other contributors, locations, um, with genus, species, orders, and um, all also have two different lines to um, be able to identify when American botanists were mentioned because there's a strong imperial agenda to specifically look at the British possessions of North America. So sometimes in the description will be said that and the Americans said this, but I can't say that this is only for North America. Um, as well as mentions of indigenous knowledge. Um, another example um, of one of the reasons in uh, acknowledgement when we go to the phase of actually writing when and how these contributors did uh, bring certain specimens from North America to um, in, Even in Hooker's publication, you can see here that the um, Priestos Plenium um, Americanum was, was given credit to Mr. W. Shepherd, but when I look at the specimen sheet, it actually says 
it's a discovery um, of Woodfield with the dates and her initials HS in the bottom right corner. Um, so again, further emphasizing that sometimes these women are there, but have not been mistranslated or miscommunicated at the time. Here are just some other examples of Mrs. Shepard, like her name being written incorrectly. So this is Quebec, Mrs. Shepard with an E will do with their ARD in, in a different hand as well. Um, and uh, here we have another example of H. Shepard written with I would say Mrs. or her normal um, initials. And that is another way where some might suppose this could be a man um, who had submitted it male botanist when in fact um, with further research we know that it's female botanist. So my question being, where are the Canadians and the women in the flora? Um, my argument is they are dislocated, yet they are discoverable. Um, and I usually like to end uh, talks on this matter with um, disagreeing with a professor, McGill, from 1997, who had said in relation to the women who participated in Hooker's project, quote, it is probably that owing to their work, the whole have been fine to collecting. Their names have gradually fallen into neglect and the part they played in the advancement of Canadian botany, important if obscure, cannot now be ascertained. I disagree. We can be ascertained. We can be known. We have Christian Ramsey, Thomas of Dalhousie, and Mary Percival, Harriet Shepherd, and just to conclude, I will put this up for you to see um, of my two main problems and the solutions that I am working with to you at the third resources currently. Thank you. Sorry. I'm very excited to say we have a little bit longer in these talks, so we have opportunity for at least one question. Any burning questions? I know there's lots in this. Uh, okay, could you tell us a little bit more about how we might embed this that seems to be the key brilliant of these projects? How does it become a normal thing that we do that makes it a matter of the how we do it? Yeah, it's a really good question. What I'm still grappling with, um, I have the working from the, I'm working from a very specific piece and then outwards, but I'm hoping that with a few key examples, uh, looking at flora with let's say female contributors and um, kind of investigating that way back into what's in the collections, we'll have enough data to maybe notice trends and then go from top down later on. But I, I do think we need to do the like work with the key case studies first. Fantastic. Uh, you're very welcome to catch up with Kimberly over lunch and the rest of the next couple of days. So thanks very much, Kimberly. And if Lucas would like to come to the